So the first question is, are migraines related to SCAD? It's, that's a difficult one. I think it's particularly difficult because migraine is very common. It's a common condition out there. Um, we've been slightly stung in the world of cardiology by the question about whether migraines are associated with small holes in the heart called um, PFOs, little leaks in the heart. And a whole sort of research program and world developed around this theory, which more recently seems to be less likely to be the case. So I think it's difficult to know the answer to that. Um, we've certainly uh, collated a, a, a you know, reasonable number of patients who've reported this. Um, but I think at the moment it remains a, a question rather than a certainty. So yes, there do seem to people, be people who have both. But um, I'm not clear that that's necessarily a causal association. So uh, sort of, some of my answers are going to be a little bit political. <laughs> I try and get around the answer. So, since SCAD, this uh, question says, I've been bothered by back pain. My GP said it wasn't connected to SCAD. Do you know of any connection? Um, and then it goes on to ask a question about whether uh, is Pilates safe as SCAD? And then there's a third question which says, I've been signed off by the cardiologist, but I'm still taking medications, but no more follow up till I have regular blood tests. So, I'll give you those, those ones in order. Back pain is not, I suppose, not clearly associated with SCAD. One of the things about hearts is that they do present in different ways, and that's one of the things that pieces of data that Abby's tried to collect from the study. We've heard a few stories today, patients who've, people who've presented with a sort of staggered onset of, of symptoms, sometimes very typical symptoms, but sometimes very different and atypical symptoms. So it is a bit difficult to tease out sometimes. So one patient's uh, sort of typical anginal chest pain, the stuff in the front of your chest, down your arms that you see on the television. There are also a, a you know, reasonable number of people whose symptoms are rather different. But I wouldn't say that there is a common association between back pain and SCAD. Excepting, I suppose, some of the comments that Sally was saying about the rehabilitation process after SCAD. Sometimes when you have something happen to you, like SCAD or another traumatic event, it takes a bit of time to get the confidence back up to getting back out there, doing the things that you were doing before, the exercise, things that you would do before. And actually sometimes if we let that get up on top of us a bit, you can actually start to decondition. You can start to lose those muscles that you, you, you used to use before you had your SCAD because you're not doing what you did before. And then sometimes the result of that is if you start trying to do a bit more exercise that you find you're a bit more exhausted than you were before or you find you get aches or pains in places where you didn't have them before. So it's difficult to answer the question in, in, in terms of the specifics. But I'm not worried about the fact that you have back pain. I would encourage you to, I mean, I think your Pilates question is a great question. I don't see any problem with doing anything like that. I, I said before that I'm a big fan of exercise in sensible amounts and so would you know largely you know, that would be my strategy I would say you know get out there get a bit fit do some back strengthening exercises or other general strengthening exercises no harm in that at all in terms of being signed up by your cardiologists i think abby's uh, said already do keep in touch you know we are happy to see you uh, if your gp writes to me then it saves the managers from uh, arresting me and taking me to the cells for illegally seeing people on the NHS without them knowing. So if your GP uh, writes uh, to me or faxes a letter to my uh, secretary, and again, if you send an email to the SCAD um, email address, then we can make the arrangements. We're happy to see you and help and give advice. Can I scuba dive now that I've had a SCAD? Could you scuba dive before? <laughs> <laughs> no reason not to at all. You know, I think it's general common sense advice. You know, I think it's important that you get back as far as possible to, uh, to normality. And if normality is that you enjoy scuba diving, that's fine. Again, common sense applies. Um, you, you know, be in a group, be with people who you know, and, uh, but there's no particular reason not to do that if that's a hobby that you enjoy, as far as I'm concerned. Um, if I answer your question and you think that's a little 
rubbish, you're allowed to chip in and go, hang on a second. <laughs> you don't know anything about scuba diving. It's probably true. Um, so the list, I'll read the list of differential diagnoses that medics work through to assist patients. Is there a need to put scan higher on the list? And if so, how can that be achieved? Um, that's a good question. It's obviously something that's quite close to our heart in terms of trying to get out there and get the message out there. And, and, and obviously there are a number of people that talked a bit about this today. Um, you know, I try to get out there to meetings whenever I'm invited, even if it's, you know, quite a trek. I try and get over there and talk to people and let them know about this. Um, and I think awareness is rising about SCAD and what's going on. Uh, Abby and... Uh, um, uh, in particular, but others as well, have, have uh, done a great job, for example, going to the main conferences in cardiology in the UK. We spike all of their little delegates' bags with flyers about SCAD and information about SCAD. And I think it is starting to have an impact. So I tend to go to meetings now and people sort of, you know, I, I get known as the SCAD guy. <laughs> so I think the message is getting out. I think there are groups to whom we still need to try and spread the words. I think I was talking to somebody earlier who said that they were going to be asked to go and talk to medical students about SCAD uh, from a patient's perspective. I can't remember who that was. But you know, I think yeah, I think that's a fantastic initiative, you know, trying to get in there early and talk to the you know the, the medical teams in their educational years about this condition and getting out there. And I think also, you know, we're, we're sort of naturally medics, so we feel quite comfortable in a room full of other doctors, and we really need to get out there and talk to the paramedics, the obstetricians, those things which are slightly scary to a cardiologist, and I'm trying to do that too, and I think, you know, we've got a distance to travel in that direction, but we're keen to do it. Will the new blood test help to speed up a diagnosis, the, the diagnosis for young women? I presume this is high sensitivity, high sensitivity to opponent that's being referred to here. So the answer is it, it will to some extent. So it would be, it would be more, it would, in, in, it would be a higher probability of it being positive than current tests. The issue, as we've already heard, Sally said it, it was in, in her story quite eloquently, and I know some of you have very similar stories, that if you're up against a medic who is so utterly convinced that you couldn't possibly be having a heart attack because you're you know, you don't look like somebody who should be having a heart attack, then all of the tests in the world don't seem to be able to convince them that actually, you know, maybe this is something that they haven't seen before. And, you know, again, obviously, the, the, the programme of education is enormously important in, in doing that. And, you know, we, we, we need to just keep that momentum going, keep the information going out there. Restatins for bypass patients, it says. Is the recommendation for the highest dose tolerated? What are my thoughts on uh, uh, an EG, a, a high 80 milligrams dose? That'll be a torvastatin, probably, seeing as these have not been researched in scanned patients. Are there any long term risks? The microphone's pretty bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> Questions about statins. 80 milligrams of, uh, of a torvastatin in bypass patients. Doses of statins. So the first thing to say, as with most things in the world of SCAD and medicines, is that this is a judgment question and is not based on you know, trials or data because we don't have those information at the moment. What we know about statins is that in atherosclerotic patients, those patients who are not you but have heart attacks because of the, the more usual disease process with the cholesterol-related deposits and so on. What's been identified in those patients is that if you treat a cholesterol of 6 and make it 5, and you take a population, the 5s do better than the 6s. If you take a population with a, a cholesterol of 5 and make it 4, the 4s do better than the 5s. And nobody's ever found the bottom of that line. And there are a number of drug companies out there at the moment. In fact, I've just been involved in a, in, a, in, a, in a research study where they're giving a newer agent which gets the cholesterol even lower, right down in the boots, not a statin, a different drug. So the data seems to suggest that if you've got a risk that's related to cholesterol, and we know that that's not necessarily the case for the majority in this room, 
that the lower that you can get the cholesterol down, the better. Now, there are caveats to that, which is that the higher the dose of statin you take, the more likely you are to get some of the problems. And although statins are pretty well tolerated, we could get into very hot water here, but they are pretty well tolerated drugs on the whole. They get a, they get a, a, a rough press sometimes, but they're very good medicines. In terms of this specific scenario of somebody with a bypass, I would suggest that you should certainly be, you know, I, I would personally recommend that you take a statin because of the risk of accelerated atherosclerosis in the vein grafts, and I alluded to that a bit earlier. In terms of the dose, I'm a pragmatist. So if you're taking a high dose and you're tolerating it, that's fine. If you're finding that you're taking a high dose and you're getting problems that you're worried about, achy muscles, indigestion, things that you feel might be related, then taking a lower dose is not, you know, this is, this is really about prevention for, you know, a decade or more's time in terms of accelerated atherosclerosis. So I think you can be a bit pragmatic is the answer to that question. If it was me, I'd try and take at least 40. That's just a sort of pragmatist's answer. Any long-term risks from statins? None that have been particularly identified. So um, we know that there are a, a very small number of people who uh, get serious problems related to statins, but they are very rare. There are large numbers of patients who have these drugs, and the number of patients who really get into trouble is pretty small. So that's a cardiologist's answer to a statins question. Um, Re-exercise. Are there limitations regarding lifting weights? Cardiac rehab encouraged this, using light weights, but what about raising above your head, for example? I'm an exercise file for lots of reasons. I think that uh, I think it, it's good for your heart, even if you have damage to the heart. In, in fact, the, there's very good studies that show if you've got some damage, that exercise is still good for the heart. You know, you have to exercise... Sally said very eloquently, which is that you have to exercise within your limits. You have to recognise your limits. This is not about, you know, getting to the point where you're starting to feel awful and going, I'm going to keep going and push my way on through this. No, exercise to what you can do, then stop, take a break, and exercise again to what you can do. But exercise is generally pretty good. In terms of lifting weights... I'm not in particularly in favour of the kind of exercise that causes your eyeballs to pop out onto the floor, okay? But light, gentle weights that build up your strength, I think is fine. We had a nice question about back pains and things earlier on. And again, you know, just generally toning up a bit, I think is there's no harm in that at all. I, you know, I think exercise sometimes gets a little bit of a bad press. That's why I talked about it earlier and some of the discussions... My view is that there's really very little data that exercise causes SCAD. Nobody's stopping me, so I'm presuming that I'm answering your questions. Ooh, red, red wine it starts with. I presume that's an offer for later. Um, HRT, should I take it? Um, I think that... I think the first thing to say is that's not an easy, easily answerable question. Um, I'm not sure that we have a lot of data to answer it. On the, if you like, of sort of standing on the opposite leg, I'm not sure that we have a lot of data to suggest that there's any problem with taking it. So I think I talked a little bit earlier about contraception and said, well, you know, from the information I have, I feel pretty comfortable about uh, hormone contraceptions in some circumstances. And I, you know, I certainly don't have anything to say to you to say there is a clear reason not to. So, slightly hedging. Uh, what can you tell us about SCAD with FMD? And should we get tested for vascular Erlos Danlos type 4? So, FMD uh, is associated with SCAD, um, and that has been identified for some time. I think the issue with FMD is what does it mean? It's associated, 
But is it a problem? Is it a disease? What trouble does it actually cause people? We know that FMD in some patients in the renal arteries can contribute to high blood pressure, but we're not particularly seeing a close association of those things in SCAD patients. So we do see something that looks a bit FMD-like when the imaging is done, but we don't really know what the significance of it is. So if you like, you could say that it's a marker of SCAD in some patients. But I think the, the, the question mark is out as to whether it has any clinical relevance, any relevance in terms of it's, it, is it going to cause any problems to people. My other slight anxiety with FMD is that all of the FMD literature is emerging from groups who are particularly interested in FMD. And they seem to find FMD everywhere. <laughs> and maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. And maybe that, you know, the frequency of FMD is as common as they say it is in SCAD. But I, you know, I do wonder whether the, the eye of the expert can pick this up and whether, you know, what I'd like to do is I'd like to send them a bunch of scans from non-SCADs on the sly <laughs> and see how many they identify as having FMD. I don't know. I'm a little bit sceptical about the FMD story, and I'm certainly not panicked about its presence in SCAD patients. In terms of testing for gen genetic abnormalities, my, my, I think our experience so far is that there are some of you out there, uh, either here or, or, or elsewhere, who have had genetic tests. Um, and I am not aware, I'm dancing slightly at Abby, I'm not aware of anybody who's had a positive genetics identified. I, I think what we find is that a lot of you get diagnosed with hypermobility syndrome, which is an EDS type 3. Yes. But it's not, the genes are not positive, it's just feature-wise you happen to be a bit more flexible, if that makes sense. So the genetic, we don't yet have anyone who's come back with a definite positive genetics, but maybe looking-wise you, you present very similar. So I'm just going to shout that out to those in the back there. What Abby's saying is that when you're going to see the geneticists, what, they, what they're doing is kind of the similar thing that uh, Abby does when you come up on the re research day, which is looking at patterns that fit with other connective tissue disorders. So that's, you know, people that are a bit more hypermobile or maybe have particular sort of, you know, long fingers or transplants. There's a whole list of things that we look for. And the geneticists will sometimes say that you have a sort of syndrome that's in keeping with something, but they don't identify the genes. So it's not really saying that much more than we already know. So um, as, I, as I think I said in my talk, in terms of gen genetics testing, I'm not sure there's much to be gained from it at, this, at the moment. Okay, but we'll certainly get it, take your DNA and have a look at it when you come up to the research day. What if our current drug regime doesn't match your suggestions today? Who do we discuss this with? Um, sorry about that. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that treatment is a judgment because it's not like treatment for a heart attack, conventional heart attack, if you like, where we've got these massive databases of tens of thousands of patients to say, this is what we should do. This is not that condition. This is, a ju this is about a judgment. We have a slight advantage over some of the other uh, people uh, who you might see in your, in your local hospitals, in that we see a bit more of it. And it just, I think, maybe helps us a little bit to make that judgment. So, but as a general rule, we don't mind being contacted. We do our best. You know, I, 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 I do apologise for when there are bits of delays in response. We're trying our best. Sometimes we get a little bit swamped. But we, we are happy to try our best to answer questions. And we are always happy to see people. Uh, in, you know, as I say, I'm always happy to see people in my NHS clinic. Uh, it helps if you can get your GP to refer you, just because it um, it keeps me out of the sort of NHS jail from a management perspective for for um, uh, for, for costing the hospital lots of money. But uh, if you if you come and see me, and if you have problems, I had a conversation a little bit earlier with somebody who said, "Look, we want to come and see you, but our local GP won't refer us." If you have problems like that, just let us know because we'll work, we'll work something out, okay? We'll ring you up or we'll come up with a solution and meet at the service station of the motor. <laughs> um, uh, are neck massages or yoga safe? I hope I've answered these questions about, about exercise. 
I think all of these things are good. Okay, and that's my view. The, as I say, the things that I wouldn't do would be Everest, you know, uh, sort of huge weights, trying to beat Usain Bolt. It's the extremes of exercise that I would be avoiding personally. But I think if you keep within yourself, as Sally said, if you recognise, you know, it's about feeling your body in a way, understanding what the signals that you're, you know, learning about what the signals that your body sends you. And, that, and those messages are different from what they were before you had your SCAD event. And you have to sort of almost relearn what your body's telling you. But I think providing you listen to your body, these things are all good. You, Karen, just uh, put a gag on me at the right moment, OK? Because yep. there's a few more. So I, I'm just going to keep going until you say, Chop. when is the best time of day to take your medications? I think so, that's a great question. One of the problems that uh, patients with SCAD often have is a low blood pressure. We, have, we meet this a lot, which is that we talked about that list, didn't we? And I said, well, look, if you've got a bit of heart damage, I want you on a beta blocker, I want you on an ACE inhibitor. And, what, and all of these things cause your blood pressure to go down. And unfortunately, because you're young, your starting blood pressure is already quite low. And then you've had a heart attack, and that knocks it a little bit further, and then we have a bit of a pickle. So the, the answer in terms of when you take your tablets depends a little bit on situations with your blood pressure and what sort of medications we're trying to get on board. So if you were to have heart damage and we're quite keen to get you on the ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker a bit of a dose to try and help the heart muscle in that situation, sometimes I'll say to patients, look, the best time to take these tablets is at night. Because if you're lying down at night, you're not going to be lightheaded if your blood pressure goes a bit lower after you take the tablets. If that's not an issue for you, then I think you can take them whenever is best for you to remember them. Because the other thing with tablets, and the other thing that you'll all have had this experience, is that you go from being a person who's never taken a tablet in your life to all of a sudden coming home from hospital with a wheelbarrow full of medications <laughs> from the doctor. And, and actually, it's not easy to change your life in such a way to try to remember to take those tablets on a regular basis. And yet, you know, those tablets, we've gone through them all, and certainly in particular uh, content, particular patients, are really important to take. So I'm a bit flexible. If it works for you that you get up in the morning and they're by your bedside table and you take them then, that's fine by me. If it just happens to be better for you that you take them, you know, when you get home from work in the afternoon, that's probably fine by me too. I think it's what works for you. It's pra practical and pragmatic. How common is it to have a precursor event? Uh, this might skew the already dubious recurrence stats. And I had a minor event five days prior to the MI. This is really common. This is really common. And I think... Again, this is one of the things that, that we're trying to get from the research study to help us to, again, try to, try to get a clear picture as to what happens to you when these things happen and also get it out there to the medical teams to start thinking about it. A staggered onset seems to be very common. You know exactly what's happening. I suspect the arteries, you get a little bleed and maybe it's restricted and it opens up and closes again, opens up again. And, and you know, this sort of... Um, is, is a very common uh, issue. The recurrent stats, you know that I'm dubious about them. I mentioned that earlier. Whether this contributes, I'm not sure, but I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that patients with SCAD are given an impression of a very high recurrence rate. And uh, my view is that our experience, we're not in a position to publish that yet, we've got a bit of a way to go, but our experience is it's not as high a recurrence rate as those that have been reported. And I think there's very clear reasons why, which is how they set up in the Mayo Clinic as a, you know, a referral center from across the US. And they're going to get those um, patients who've had a much uh, much more serious incident or recurrent events or have something in the family. So it's going to enrich for those people, that's my point. Okay? And I, I suspect that the real world out there, I, I suspect the real world 
is that there's probably quite a lot of people who get this. And because you know, they're young, maybe female, they're fit, they don't have any risk factors, there's probably quite a lot of them that never even go to hospital. And then there's probably another group that do go to hospital, and the guy in a and &E goes, you know, here's a Remy and a glass of milk, and off you go. <laughs> you know, there's probably quite a lot of, of underdiagnosis out there. So don't forget that when you're interpreting the recurrence rates, that they are really those patients at the top end of the spectrum. Here we go. Well, it's not as long as it looks. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, should you stop exercising if you get chest pain? We've had a, a nice discussion on this, uh, and I think Sally said it much more eloquently than I can, which is that it, uh, it's all about listening to your body. So I am not in favour of people pushing through symptoms if they get them, but I am in favour of people building up their exercise over time and getting an increase in their exercise capacity and I don't think it's any different to what we see in our other heart patients, which is it's about, you know, to start with, it's about little and often, and then it's about building things up over time. So, yes, if you get chest pain when you've exercised for a certain distance, I would stop and rest. doesn't mean you need to go home to bed. You can just have a little stop, give it five, and then you can start again. And if that happens at 100 yards, stop and rest, take in the view. Nice bit of sun now. Do another 100 yards, get a bit of chest pain, stop, take a rest. And then what you'll find over time is what was 100 yards becomes 150 yards. And what was 150 yards becomes half a mile. And that's the approach. Sometimes the cardiac re rehabilitation team is very varied across the UK. Cardiac rehabilitation in Leicestershire is brilliant. They are really fantastic. And they will take you through these processes and build up your confidence in terms of Getting, getting your exercise uh, back up to those levels. I have, I have to have annual scans for kidney and aorta aneurysms. Would you recommend CT or MRI as concerns have been raised about radiation from CT scans on a long-term basis? So the first thing to say, as I mentioned earlier, is that this does happen. There are some patients who, obviously somebody here, who has this issue. I don't think it's that common. Okay. In terms of the serial scanning, so following these things up, it does depend a little bit on what the local expertise is. So, yes, CT scans do involve an X-ray dose. And over the course of time, if you have a CT scan every year for 20 years, you will be accumulating X-rays as you do that. If you have a, a centre that has a very good MRA service and they're able to do the same sorts of things with MRI, then I would certainly talk to them about that. But the most important thing is that somebody's keeping a proper eye on these things. And if, the, if, the lo where, if, if where you are locally, they say, look, at the moment, CT's where it's at, then stick with that. You may find in a few years' time they upgrade their scanners, the MRI capability improves and they can do it. So I'm very aware that that is a capability that's not necessarily available across the UK. I suspect it will become more available over time. So you may need to be a little bit understanding, but I think it is important clearly to follow the advice in terms of keeping these things under surveillance properly. How long does the evidence of damage last? Heart damage, I think this is. How long uh, can it go on repairing? So that's another great question. So heart, the heart damage itself uh, is usually done and dusted quite quickly. So the injury occurs. But what happens is the heart adapts to the injury over time. So it develops a scar where the injury has occurred, and then it adapts to that. And sometimes when it does its adaptation, it does it in an unfavourable way. So what we all want is for it to kind of ignore the scar or at least sort of enclose it out and carry on pumping in its best way. But sometimes when the heart has a scar on it, it adapts, it maladapts, it gets bigger and it doesn't pump as well or it doesn't pump as evenly or consistently over time. And that is where some of these medications come into play. So I mentioned quite early on in my talk 
that your management in terms of tablets and other things does depend a lot on heart damage and what damage was done at the time. Because certainly if you have a significant injury, those tablets, those beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors and things like that, those, what those tablets are doing is they are keeping the heart from, uh, we, we call it remodeling, changing its shape in an adverse way. So that's why we want you to keep taking those tablets, because it stops the heart from dilating up or getting into difficulties. <coughs> those tablets are very good at doing those kind of things. So it's less, if you like, that damage continues, but more that some hearts want to remodel as a result of the injury in a way that's not helpful to you and your body. And that's where the tablets can help. And very occasionally, special pacemakers can be used to try and help with that in, in uh, some patients. Uh, any connection found yet between glaucoma, migraine and skin? So I've talked about migraine, and I think glaucoma probably in a similar boat. And I think, and we also talked about back pain at the beginning. One of the challenges, and this is, a, this is a sort of a more general point as well, is that as you go on uh, sort of learning about your body after, after SCAD, you also have to try and keep an open mind about symptoms that you get. It's very easy if you've had a heart problem to attribute all symptoms that you get to your heart. And maybe if you get a bit of gut pain or back pain or hip pain or a headache, you think, well, it's probably related to the SCAD because that's the big thing that I've had in my life. And the only thing that makes me worried as a doctor is just to say, look, if you get something that's new and different, just make sure you have a chat to your GP and get it checked out as well, just in case it's something different. Because it's sometimes, I've, I see people that, you know, it all gets lumped into the kind of it's my, it's my heart thing. But just make extra sure if you've got something new, does no harm to go and talk to somebody about it, just in case there's a different problem that needs to be investigated and thought about in different ways. And we have to be careful with that. And, and you know, sort of, we end up being sort of super specialist SCAD cardiologists, and people come with something else, and we go, oh gosh, we don't know anything about the tummy. I've seen one of those for years. Um, what support is there for SCAD patients? In terms of uh, you, you've obviously heard a lot today about the support from your peers and uh, some new uh, developments, particularly exciting developments about that. Um, from my perspective, we will always try our best to respond to questions, queries, concerns. Um, we do our best to see people, sometimes at short notice, if they want to come and see us and talk, talk to us or developing symptoms. Clearly, it's difficult for us to provide sort of minute-by-minute minute type of advice just because we get swamped. <coughs> but we will always do our best. So, uh, you know, please get in contact. We're happy to try and provide the support, uh, whatever support's required, um, if there are particular questions. When will we know the answers? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give them all, haven't I? <laughs> um, I ended my talk with the Australopith Australopithecus footprints. And I think that, you know, this is a journey. And I suspect that the answers are not going to be immediate and easy. And that's why we have to stick to the path. I don't think this is a monogenetic condition, for example, where we're going to find a single gene, it's all going to be easy, wrap it up and move on. I think it's going to be a bit more complicated than that. Abby's already identified that there is a heterogeneity within the group. There are differences. There are different subtypes of people who are getting this kind of problem. So I think we just have to keep going, working together. Yes, the genetics is important. We want to look at biomarkers. Can we come up with new things that might be able to, for example, diagnose somebody as a SCAD as opposed to another type of heart attack? Is there a blood test that you could do to say, look, this is, this is a different thing or not? There are lots and lots of questions. So um, we'll have another go at this question next year, shall we? <laughs> uh, how long would you recommend isosorbide mononitrates are taken for? Um, I presume this means over sort of years rather than within a day. I'll talk quickly about a day. So within a day, 
important thing to remember with nitrates, so isosorbide mononitrate, Imdur, those type of tablets, is that they have a tolerance issue. So sometimes people will take them three times a day, or at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. If you're taking your nitrates like that, they will not be working, okay? Because you just become tolerant to them. If you've got nitrate in your system all the time, your body just gets used to it. So generally speaking, it should be taken, if you're taking a long-acting version, once in the morning, or once anyway. If you're taking the shorter-acting version, you take it first thing in the morning, just after lunch, about 2 o'clock. In terms of how long should you take it for, for life, nitrates are a vasodilator. They dilate up the arteries. They don't uh, help with, uh, for example, damaged hearts or some of the other drugs I've talked about. So they're really a symptomatic treatment. So if you have problems, for example, with recurrent chest pains, possibly related to, to vasospasm, we've talked a bit about some of those questions, and we or your other doctors have suggested the nitrates might help, if you take them and it helps, then carry on taking them. There's no reason to stop. You can trial without. If your chest pains come back, then it's telling you something. There is symptomatic treatment. Okay? So there's no reason to take them because you've had SCAD. The reason to take them is if they help you with any chest pains that you get after your SCAD. And you know, there's a significant uh, group of you who will have those kind of symptoms. I think... If I, if I haven't answered your question, shout it out. I think I've got to the bottom of the bucket. I've kicked the bucket. <laughs> yes? Um, I have a question actually, um, related to the um, doses of radiation that um, you're using. Is that I think that's a great question. And, you know, it's a bit like when you go to the dentist. Whenever I go to the dentist, they always take an x-ray of my teeth. And I'm like, well, I thought you were a dentist. You know, can't you tell? And I think, you know, the same applies to some extent with a chest x-ray. Um, in mitigation, a chest x-ray is a very low dose. So if you were to work out the number of chest x-rays required to get up to the same dose of x-rays as an angiogram, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but it will probably be, you know, of the order of several hundred, I suspect. Um, and the same applies in terms of the ratio of a chest x-ray to a CT scan. So it's a very low dose, and often because it's such a very low dose, the knee-jerk response when somebody comes in with new symptoms is it's almost part of the routine investigation profile. It shouldn't be. In fact, there should be a thought process that goes on um, uh, before uh, applying for a chest X-ray for anybody because it does involve a dose of X-rays, as you say. Um, but it does tend to form a kind of, you know, uh, part of a baseline of investigations. But I think it is a very low dose of chest X-ray. The CT scans is different because the dose from a CT scan is a bit higher. You know, it's not prohibitively high. But if you're accumulating them by having annual CT scans, you're starting to build that up over time. But you have to offset that against the risk of not knowing what's going on with your aneurysms and your disease. So it's a balancing act, as with all things that involve x-rays. Any other questions? Yes? Can you have an MRI after stents? Yes, you can. Yeah, it's entirely safe to do that, yeah. Anything else? Excellent. Well, your timing is impeccable. As, <laughs> as always. As <laughs>